Across 400 million years, long before and long after the dinosaur ruled the continents, the sea has remained the unchallenged domain of the shark. Yet recently, another species has begun to intrude. Lords of the land, we enter the ocean as potential prey. But of 370 shark species, only about 30 attack humans. Most, like the bottom shark maturing in an egg case, are small or harmless. Other young, however, born live from larger sharks, are so aggressive, they often devour one another inside their mothers before birth. Now an extraordinary expedition begins to probe the true nature of these mysterious creatures. Can we learn to live in their midst? Or will the shark ever remain our most frightening enemy in the wild? Renowned marine biologist Eugenie Clark never feared sharks, and at 70, still swims among them. I was nine when I saw my first live shark. It was at the old New York Aquarium, and they looked so beautiful. I had my nose pressed up against the glass. I wanted to be in there with them. It never occurred to me that they were dangerous. Dr. Clark believes sharks hold important secrets of survival which can benefit humankind. They have an incredible immune system, perhaps the strongest in the animal kingdom. They can fight off diseases, including malignant cancer. There are substances derived from sharks that can put some cancers in remission. Dr. Clark feels that sharks deserve protection, an opinion shared by her friend Rodney Fox, despite a great white shark attack that nearly tore Rodney in half. 462 stitches later, he launched a career leading expeditions into shark-infested waters. After my shark attack in 1963, I really hated sharks. But after studying them for just a short time, I've come to really appreciate them. However, I'm really keen on these trips to find an effective shark repellent. The central question is, why do some sharks attack humans? In the hope of finding out, Dr. Clark and Rodney Fox now embark on three expeditions to study the feeding and attack behavior of the great sharks. But today we're going to be using the leopard shark. Work begins at California State University, Long Beach, where Dr. Don Nelson is testing a new shark repellent. Namely, when the chemical is evenly dispersed in uh, the water. A natural shark repellent discovered by Dr. Clark has proven impractical, leading to a search for a synthetic alternative. Effective in the lab, the new chemical must now be tested in the wild. In the Catalina Channel off Southern California, the team enters waters home to sea lions, a favorite prey of many large sharks. Some scientists believe that sharks often attack humans in error, mistaking swimmers for sea lions. 
Preying upon the less fit among their quarry, sharks perform a vital evolutionary service and perhaps bear large responsibility for the sea lion's remarkable speed and agility. Experiments with the new repellent begin in a notorious hunting ground of blue sharks adjacent to the kelp forests. By spreading a chum of ground mackerel, they hope to create a drifting scent trail, leading sharks directly to the boat. As a safeguard against shark bites, Rodney Fox will don a special chain mail suit. Yet, as the scars across his chest and back suggest, the suit would offer little protection against sharks as large as great whites. Marine biologist Rocky Strong will release a new repellent using a pressurized squirt gun. I feel like a, a knight in shining armor. Let me put that helmet on. My students, who know I'm in my 70s, raise their eyebrows when they hear I'm diving with sharks again. While Dr. Clark and Rodney Fox observe from a steel cage, a safety diver in chain mail will serve as lookout and attempt to lure the sharks with bait. Hello, this is Mandy. Can you both hear me? Loud and clear. Rodney, what is the visibility like? It's pretty good at the moment. I don't see any sharks yet. Our safety diver is almost in position. The plan is to distract the sharks with the bait giving Rocky Strong a chance to fire the repellent. Unexpectedly, the first arrivals are not sharks. Jeannie, do you see what I see? The food offerings draw a flock of shearwaters, masters of underwater flight. Though they rarely exceed 10 feet, blue sharks travel and can attack in packs. Ranging widely, often feeding in a frenzy, the blue serves as our most common image of a lethal shark. Close 
Sweeney, how close to the front of the cage are they coming? Watch out! It's got my hand! His hand suddenly seized by the shark, Rodney struggles to pull free. I was feeding him and he nearly swallowed my hand. At least the chainmail kept him from biting through. Okay, I see John now. While the shark's attention is on bait, Dr. Nelson approaches with a tagging spear. In the future, if the shark is caught, the tag will reveal its range, territory, and growth rate. The repellent test begins with a mild concentration released into the shark's mouth. Oh no, Judy. He's coming back. I think maybe he likes the stuff. As Rocky Strong returns to the boat to reload with a stronger solution of the repellent, Rodney leaves the cage to assist the safety diver in keeping the sharks near. As I was trying to keep the shark around by waving the bait at him, I lost one of my fins. And while trying to get it back on, I started sinking. I dropped the weights on the outside of my suit and tried to reach the buoyancy inflator, but it was out of reach and I couldn't get to it. I knew then that I'd have to take off the air tanks and risk dislodging my helmet in order to inflate the vest, or I was certainly going to die. Rodney, do you read me? Help me, somebody help me! Rodney manages at last to inflate his vest and reach the surface, where a safety diver rushes to his aid. It was pretty frightening to be in the water and suddenly he's not there and to realize that your close friend is going down in, in that depth and there wasn't any way we could help him. I thought we'd lost Rodney. <laughs> I couldn't find my inflator. <coughs> I really, I thought I was going to die. You all right? In the end, tests of the repellent proved disappointing. While the search for a defense against sharks continues, the master of the sea prevails. of Western Australia, the team sets out on a rare mission to locate one of the sea's most elusive creatures, the giant whale shark. On occasion, whale sharks have been sighted near Ningaloo Reef, but the reason for their appearances is unknown. Dr. Clark and Rodney believe they may be able to solve the mystery and advance science, a prospect that draws a photographic team from National Geographic magazine. We planned this expedition based on the theory that whale sharks would come to feed on a massive bloom of plankton triggered by coral spawning. And that was the key, because we knew that certain species of coral in Ningaloo Reef spawn for a brief few minutes, one or two nights a year, about a week after the March full moon. Our first task was to locate an area of good spawning activity, so that we would know exactly where to begin our search for whale sharks in the morning.
builders of vast undersea structures. Corals are not plants, but colonies of tiny animals. Only recently, science has found that they often reproduce by releasing a storm of eggs and sperm that scatter in the currents like seeds in the wind. At the appointed hour, bundles of eggs and sperm rise from the coral polyps by the billions in a blizzard of new life. The mass birth is banquet as well. Swarms of worms emerge to feast on the spawn. The prolific spawning may have been known to whale sharks for eons. If so, can they predict its time and place? Are they en route here to feed even now? Okay, George, we see the boat now. No sharks just yet. Roger, we'll dive as soon as you can set it up for us. Okay, George, I'll find you a nice big one right behind you now. Roger! By morning, the theory seems to be confirmed. A whale shark is spotted right off the port bow of the launch. Looks terrific from here, George. <sighs> okay, we got up to him now. Just hang on there and he'll swim alongside you. <sighs> roger, Roger. Our divers are watching now as he comes in. <sighs> Obviously a phatogenic type of fish, this bloke. So the divers are ready to go. I'll leave it to you. Divers stand by. Incredibly, it is the first of 12 to arrive this day, perhaps the largest gathering of whale sharks ever recorded. We had no idea how long the shark would stay, and nobody wanted to risk losing the opportunity, so we all scrambled in. Some of us wanted to tag the shark and plot its daily movement. Others wanted photographs. I wanted to experience the thrill of a close encounter with this alien creature. Though it bears resemblance to a whale, the whale shark is not mammal, but fish, the largest fish in the world. So immense, it dwarfs some species of whales. The whale shark's mouth, backed up by a body sometimes 50 feet long and 20 tons, seems capable of engulfing a diver, yet it acts merely as a strainer to capture plankton. Like courtiers to a king, small fish attend to the giant perhaps cleaning away parasites and gaining a free ride on its bow wave. As the big dorsal fin came by, I just couldn't resist taking a ride. Soon he decided I was a bit of a nuisance and shrugged me off like a fly. The discovery of a whale shark feeding ground promises new opportunities to study these gentle creatures. During the next expedition, however, the team will need all the protection it can devise.
near Port Lincoln, off the South Australia coast, the expedition will attempt to encounter at close range the most feared creature in the sea, the notorious great white shark. They charter a vessel specially equipped to study great whites and bring aboard a new plastic cage nearly invisible to a shark underwater. I think it'll be pretty safe. A diver within should appear unprotected. The team will investigate the riddle at the heart of our fascination with sharks. Why do sharks like the great white attack human swimmers? And in the often murky or dark sea, what attracts them to us? Are they drawn by smell or splashing movements? Or are they attracted visually to the sight of a human? Well, I hope to detect to see if they can, the sharks can sense that invisible barrier and also to see if they're interested in me as a human shape. If sharks do attack humans on sight, they should attack Rodney on sight, since the plastic cage is nearly invisible in water. No sharks are seen, but there is convincing evidence of their presence. Okay, let's get the camera team and Rodney suited up. Do your communications check. Rodney Fox, camera team, suit in please. Deck crew prepare cages one and two, and on my word, put the camera cage in the water. Lower Rodney into the water please, and hold at 10 feet. Visibility like? The water is very clear. I'm surrounded by a school of small fish at the moment. I feel like I'm the one in the goldfish bowl. Rodney, behind you. Oh, I think I got a glimpse of one. No, it's just a bait. Last time I dove at night with the great whites, they came in and smashed up the lights. If they're out there tonight, they're being pretty shy. Curiously, no great whites appear all night. Even though sea lions, a favorite white shark meal, throng the waters. Researchers believe that roaming great whites search the water for scent trails that lead to sea lions or their relatives, then wait along the bottom to rocket upward in surprise attacks. In hopes of luring the great whites, a soup of minced fish and blood is pumped into the water. Two days passed and still no sharks. But I've been on expeditions where we've had to wait much longer before seeing our first shark. I'm concerned that white shark populations may be in serious decline due to overfishing and souvenir hunters who slaughter sharks for their jaws and teeth.
Okay, and Rodney has full flow. How's this, Rodney? Do you read me? Testing? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Tubes at 20 feet, 30, 40, 50, 60, and at the bottom at 73 feet. Here I was about to meet an old enemy face to face. I thought I'd be scared out of my wits, but when I reached the bottom, I was overcome not by fear but amazement, because instead of one or two sharks, there was a whole army waiting for me. More great whites than I'd ever seen in one place before. Oh, you ought to see it. They're everywhere down here. At least six whites circle Rodney, but none moves to attack. Two swimming around at the surface. Rodney, there's a stingray behind you. He'd better watch his tail. Aware that nearly all attacks on humans occur near the surface, they decide to raise the tube and see if the sharks grow more aggressive. We had six, possibly eight sharks swimming around Rodney who appeared completely at their mercy and yet not one of those sharks attacked him. Though sight has not provoked an attack, perhaps aggression will be triggered by sound, scent, or the electrical fields emitted by all living things and detected by sharks. Okay, people, let's keep on our toes. We're gonna have three cages in the water this dive. We're gonna have six divers in. Jeannie will be in the science cage with her team. Rodney will be in the Lexan, and the camera crew will be in the third. Our cage had two clear plastic sides, giving us a view nearly as good as Rodney's, and to the sharks, we probably looked just as vulnerable. Great whites have been documented as large as 20 feet and more than 7,000 pounds. And there are unconfirmed reports of even larger individuals. For all their size and power, the great whites may simply be wary of devices and creatures never before encountered. Yet an attack could come at any time from silent hunters that generally attack quietly from behind or below. Great whites are believed to possess good long-range vision. But as the team looks on, a near collision occurs. Perhaps evidence that their close-up vision is poor.
Despite hours of circling, still no move toward Rodney. Perhaps they aren't hungry. For all their indifference to humans, there is no mistaking their interest in tuna. Let's see what happens if we stop feeding them. Rodney, we're going to stop chumming now. Though blood still saturates the water, bait is removed. But for one fish dangled as a lure near the cage. Oh boy, look at that smile. He's coming straight towards me, nose towards the cage, and he's oh, he's gonna hit the cage. He's not gonna get a photograph of this. I'm to burn the cage. I've got a dance because my toes are hanging out. Nice! Oh, boy, he's right in with his nose into the cage and it wobbles like a jelly. <laughs> the shark now seems drawn more to the metal of the science cage than to the divers within. A result of sensory urges to test bite anything creating electrical currents in water. Here he comes back. When Rodney was attacked in 1963, he was spear fishing. The shark was probably attracted by the smell and thrashing sound of speared fish. Now, another great white heads aggressively for Rodney. both okay, the shark and I. I really believe that in this case at least, he was more curious than anything else. He just got caught up in the ropes and was trying to get away. I know that sharks, even white sharks, are not the cold mechanical eating machines of popular myth. The truth is, they've been around thriving for so long with very few enemies until we entered their realm. The legendary hunter that frightens humans 
enhances life in the sea. Sharks may never inspire our affection, like dolphins and whales, but they are just as vital to the future of the ocean and as deserving of our appreciation and protection. Not as monsters, but ancient survivors with priceless secrets to share. Dangerous, forbidding, ruler of its domain. Okay, this is gonna be a take. In an effort to find out more about these magnificent animals. And sounds rolling. Camera rolling. Graphic Films goes in search of the great white shark. Action! Once again, director Mal Wolf okay. teams with Graphic Films and co-producers Paul Novers and George Casey in order to bring you an incredible viewing experience. Made in association with the Science Museum of Minnesota, Goto Optical, and the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History, In Search of the Great White is shot in the breathtaking IMAX format. Well, that was pretty exciting. With a shooting schedule spanning one and a half years and three oceans, director Wolf assembled a team of shark experts, which included the likes of marine scientist Dr. Eugenie Clark, and Australia's world-renowned shark hunter Rodney Fox in order to present a view of the great sharks as they have never been seen before. The hand-picked crew was also put to the test as a result of the demanding IMAX camera. And getting it in the water on a rough day, it's really tedious. You get a boat rocking in the swell and, you know, the, the motion going back and forth with a 400-pound piece of metal. Um, someone could get hurt, so it's really, you know, the crew on the boat is really a uh, real valuable, super valuable part of the team. Underwater, um, the, with the liquid medium, if your camera's weighted properly, you can use the water to help you. Instead of using zoom lenses like you would use on uh, in land, you can use the camera, just swim it in, float it in, float it out, and, and it lends itself to some creative uh, camera work. of camera work more apparent than in the sequence shot off the coast of Australia, where an incredible dive with a whale shark allowed for some truly spectacular footage. Pushing the limits of filmmaking technology became an everyday experience for the graphic film's crew. 
shark-resistant chainmail suits, state-of-the-art underwater communications equipment, and a special optically clear Lexan tube was designed and utilized in order to bring the viewer never-before-seen footage of the great whites. What's the view like down there, Rodney? Oh, there's a big shark down the bed. The untested tube gave the diver a clear 360-degree view of the animals, while hopefully keeping him safe. You're awfully brave to be down there, Rodney. I don't think I'd like being all alone in that cage. That makes you look like you're right out in the open water. There's three great big white sharks here. Oh boy, look at that. I had a little shiver going through my spine as he came closer. <laughs> now he's circling. Uh oh, he's got bumping. Oops, he tried to break the cage. I've got to dance a bit because my toes are hanging out. He's coming back right at me. No, oh, he's going to bite the hose. He's going to bite the hose. Pull the hose and the ropes in. He's caught in the ropes, he's tangled, he's trying to get away. He's been in the cage, he's biting, he's biting. <laughs> this dramatic attack on the tube occurred spontaneously and was captured as the actual events took place. And even though every possible precaution is taken to safeguard the divers and crew, a certain amount of risk is involved when filming under such extreme conditions. Ironically, the most frightening incident of the filming had nothing to do with any of the shark encounters but instead occurred while Rodney, here on a dive with Eugenie Clark, was testing a chainmail shark suit used for protection in the event of a shark attack. I tried on the suit, the chainmail shark repellent, and that was really a, uh, a difficult thing because, first of all, it restricted my movements tremendously. That caused me some concern. His concern was well-founded as the weight of the suit combined with the limited mobility and the loss of a fin, found Rodney sinking to the depths of the ocean floor, some 3,000 feet below. Can you read me now, Rodney? Can you read me now, Rodney? You got Rodney Fox on the bottom? No. Where is he? Yeah. Joe, Joe, you hear it? Yeah. No. Rodney, do you talk to Hey, Rodney, where are you? Hey, Don, put your mask and fins on and get in the water. Give it to the spot. Rodney, can you copy over? Here, in footage later recreated for inclusion in the film, Rodney calls upon some 6,000 hours of diving experience, which allows him to stay calm, drop his weights, and eventually inflate his buoyancy compensator vest and rise to safety. Suddenly, Rodney's vest was spotted bobbing in the water several hundred yards away. As the boat sped to his aid, the much relieved crew was greeted by a battered, but very much alive, Rodney Fox. Where's the party? Yeah. Where's the sure. party? I thought we'd lost Rodney. I mean, it was pretty frightening to be in the water and suddenly he's not there with you and you look up and he's not up and you know the only way, only other place he could be is down. And you know you've got 3,000 feet under you. But when all is said and done, does director Wolf believe the risks of working in the IMAX format to be worth the rewards? The rewards are great. In the Omnimax and the IMAX format, uh, you're actually putting the audience in the scene. And uh, say, for instance, in the great white scene, the audience has a chance to make that dive. They're going to see that shark coming up, nibbling on the front of the cage. Uh, they're going to be taken through the joys of working in the water, and maybe the little sad parts, and uh, maybe the little chancy parts. Uh, they're going to grab the seat a little bit and maybe move back in their seat when that great white swims right up to them. 